All right, it's two o'clock. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, welcome everyone to, we're, to the presentation on Fishing at Penn, Coordinating Fishing Response in a Decentralized University. Um, my name is Bob Desolitz. I'm one of the senior information security analysts in the Security Operations Center at Penn. And with me is my colleague, Mike Sanker, also a senior information security analyst. Um, we're gonna be discussing um, how we handle phishing in, in a strange environment of a decentralized university, um, where we've been and where we're going. So please um, raise, bring, we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, let me get started. So, uh, I've got some technical difficulties here, bear with me. Um, to give you some background at IT, at Penn in general, um, we are a highly decentralized university in that we've got at least 25 schools and centers, at least the ones that are the major schools and centers. There's plenty of other minor ones. Um, they're, they're individually funded. Um, we also have a he separate health system, which is considered, while under the University of Pennsylvania trustees, it's a separate entity for all intents and purposes. Um, IT funding is given directly from the university to schools and centers to use it however they see fit for the most part. Um, some of that money then comes back to the central um, group, Information Systems and Computing, of which Mike and I are a part of, um, but it's no requirement that they use our services for everything. That includes email, networking, um, desktop support. Um, so it, it, most of what we do and what Information Systems and Computing does from a central perspective is try and and provide you know, services that make it good business sense for schools and centers to be part of our group. But um, yeah, a lot of schools and centers have chosen to go other directions. Um, I say networking is provided centrally here with an asterisk. Um, the School of Engineering, the School of Medicine, um, and maybe one or two other organizations run their own networking um, for historical reasons. Um, the, I did mention information systems and computing is the central IT unit. And in there, we have about 300 um, IT employees out of about 900 total for the university. So it's a good significant amount um, of IT folks at Penn. Um, our office, the Office of Information Security, sits within ISC, but we are not ISC's information security office. Um, even the folks in ISC still don't, a lot of folks still don't make that connection. Um, we, we provide consulting essentially for the university at large and incident response, but we don't provide operational security for the schools and centers. That's really up to them. And I say we have no central authority, again, with an asterisk. Um, the exception there is that the, the policy creation process and policy um, updating process now sits within our office. Um, and then within the information Office of Information Security, the Security Operations Center, the team which Mike and I are part of, um, has a SOC director, um, three security analysts, Mike and I being two of them, and our colleague Douglas Colley, the other analyst. Um, we also have an operations director and an operations engineer, and those are the folks really that, that provide all the automation, um, the systems administration for some of the larger systems that we run, um, they provide the glue that really allows us to run with a small lean team yet still um, punch above our weight when it comes um, to processing incidents, handling um, daily tickets. Um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the automation that they provided. So I want to make sure I give them a shout out. And pass it over to Mike. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, taking off from uh, the decentralized theme of that uh, that Bob has uh, put before us for the university writ large, there was also that same de decentralization in um, email specific in the email specific arena. So, you know, historically, um, IT shops grew up running their own mail systems. Um, prior to uh, my getting here about five years ago, probably long before that. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody ran their own mail exchanger records and their own name service records. 
you know, in, in much further past that was trimmed down, but until the very recent past, um, MX records, although centrally run were distributed across the university. So a lot of schools and centers would use their ter tertiary domain space, that, that space to the left of your, uh, UPenn dot, of our upenn.edu as their mail domain space, and they would manage it themselves. And that, you know, had a number of problems from a, from a security perspective. Um, one of them was that there's no, there was no, although there was efforts to be made through committee and things to come up with some common threat scoring, you know, what happens to email if it scores a certain score, uh, if it gets a spam score, you know, through your filtering software. But those things over time drift apart, you know, uh, some IT directors are stricter and others aren't. So when you're sending large mails and th mailings, that can be a problem because some things are going into mailboxes. So it's, you know, having no commonality across that, no expectation of what may happen to email was always problematic. Um, again, no common spam filtering rules. So, uh, you know, one mail system would let an email in and another email system, you know, would block it for the reasons that, that you know, for its own reasons. Um, there was no central sort of virus detection and no central management, no hash sharing. So if we did see a malicious hash come through, there was really no good mechanism to have that located somewhere centrally where we could use it as an indicator of compromise. Same thing with uh, link detection. Um, and again, you know, just different approaches to stopping viruses and malicious links. Again, part of that is scoring. Part of that is the software people were using, you know, anywhere from fully baked, um, corporate, you know, mail solutions to open source, you know, using MIME, DFANG and, and some different open source tools, but it was really all over the map. And probably the biggest thing was there was no central logging. Again, no place where if we did find indicators of compromise that we could just go at, from a central IT security unit and just, you know, do our research, do our investigation, um, do incident response. We really had to reach out to other IT groups ask for their logs, you know, and and uh, and would always have to be bringing other people in if if we did have to raise an incident up. Um, go ahead, I mean, you move the next one, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, over the years, there was a paring down of uh, that that rampant decentralization. ISD uh, brought 0365 in and encouraged uh, schools and centers to migrate their mail systems to 0365. Many schools did. Um, many schools also, be for cost reasons, uh, separated their populations here uh, to have students use G Suite because, you know, the price uh, can't be free. And the um, put faculty and staff on the 0365 tenant, but it was still um, uh, a narrowing down of email systems that we had to manage and, and more, um, you know, sort of known quantities in terms of logging and that sent those 0365 logs were central. We still had some schools running their own 0365 tenants um, and, and due to this day, um, but um, for the most part, we began to see this centralization probably again, a decade ago, I would say, Bob, I'll, I'll, you've been here longer than I have. I, I think, you know, probably better than a decade ago. Yeah, um, definitely. We began to see this decentralization. Right. Yeah, I would say just to piggyback on that, we've made some accommodations to mail routing for local schools and centers so they can continue um, keeping some of their, um, their vanity mail addresses. Isn't that correct, Mike? That's right. Some people can keep mail, but I know a long, a long standing initiative at the university was, you know, what do you do about share when you're trying to combine desperate mail systems? Uh, what do you do about the things to the left of the at symbol? You know, if you had a security at some domain, let's say, you know, SAS, uh, the School of Arts and Sciences here at our university, you know, and we bring that down, you know, security and, and you start to centralize that there cannot really be a security at SAS in the same way. Once this, the address for SAS and the address for the upenn.edu mail have to go to the same place. So there was a big effort again before I was here to develop policy around how names are given out in a way that wouldn't cause conflicts. And again, this was all a long, the really long tail of 
you know, efforts to centralize things that make sense, even though, you know, that makes sense from an IT perspective, even though from many other factors in and the way things operate at the university still remain decentralized. Right. Um, so talking about what we have at our disposal for incident response and phishing in particular, um, we run really two different ticketing systems right now. Our main one internally is RT with the IR added. It's a request tracker with incident response. Um, it's a product through best practical. It's open source. We've been using it for years. Um, the API and source code are all fully available. Our ops team has really customized it and automated a lot of their the, the ticket responses to the point where some of the, the like for DMCA tickets, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the complaints that come in, most of the time we don't even see them at all. They come in, get routed, and out to the right individuals without you know any user intervention. Um, and the the central ISC uses Remedy, and so we have to monitor some of the tickets that come in through our central computing help desk pool um, to make sure that we're we're handling um, consultations or incidents as they come in that way. Um, I mentioned there's custom scripting and automation in RTIR in particular. Um, we have to query multiple data sources um, to really figure out who's who at the university and who supports them. So there are scripts that determine the LSP or the local support provider for the individual once we've identified the individual, um, determine the port location, where physically in the buildings all the way across Penn's campus and the um, satellite campuses is the thing located. Or if the user is on wireless, um, we we need um, custom scripting to query multiple data sources in order to figure out who that person is and where they belong. Um, and then I mentioned there's automatic ticket handling. That's a lot of scripting that takes place. Um, there's more than that, but that's the majority of what we're dealing with right now. Um, other things we make heavy use of in an incident for phishing in particular is net network analytics. Um, we're using Zeek on the back end to look at network traffic across the wire and, and monitor flows. Um, the fish tank, or I'll get to that in a second, Splunk is heavily used at this point. We route as many logs as possible into the central logging repository, and that really allows us to quickly respond to incidents or query things that happened you know, up to you know, three months ago um, to determine whether it's an issue. Um, I mentioned the fish tank here. We don't currently use it. Um, this was an effort that we made over a long period of time to capture phishing response, phishing uh, messages that came into the university to alert the university community. But when up to 10 years ago, we found one of the largest consumers of the data were Nigerian IP addresses. So we haven't, we put that behind um, credentials at this point and don't make much use of it um, as we've got other tools in place to help. If I just, um, if I could add the, the re way this relates to phishing response is RTIR and the ticketing systems are the main intake for all, all security events across the university, really. I mean, end users you, and, and the security at upenn.edu email, I'm sorry if you already said this, Bob, but security at upenn.edu email routes to the RTIR request tracker system. Yes. So it really is as much as there is, you know, as much as there is a central place to send things, Local service providers, which are the the colloquial term for the people that do desktop support for the schools and centers, local support providers know. Oh, it's it's up on the slide. Sorry. Uh, local support providers know to send mail to security, and um, and also end users send, you know, phishing emails, you know, threats, potential compromises, suspicious activity, you know, all that stuff gets sent to um, RTIR. So it's really the best tool we have to get metrics on the amount of fishes and other things that we see come across the wire here at the university. Right. Um, so when we handle a fish, um, there's a number of steps that we work on at the moment. Um, we, we tend to use the, for any incident, we use the pickerel process. Um, it's made popular by SANS and other institutions, the preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned process. So that's how we sort of frame any of our incident response, including phishing. Um, it's a mostly manual process response at this point. We're, we are 
working on a standard operating procedure, but a lot of our tools are relatively new and we're still trying to make the best use of them. But the typical sort of steps that we go through is to determine, number one, did the end user submit credentials to the malicious host? So we typically get a report from the end user or their support provider um, flagging uh, this is a potential problem. We want to know, you know, did they submit anything? Did they did they respond with money, for instance? Did they submit their credentials? If they did, um, work with this LSP to reset their credentials immediately. And if no, proceed to further analysis. Um, we'll copy the link address or any uh, URLs that are included in the message. Um, open that in a protected browser. It was just a like a Google Docs fake um, login page or something other that we can determine, you know, was this an attempt to grab credentials or something else? Um, we'll also try and relieve, retrieve the malicious page using Kali or a protected browser. Um, we'll review the source code to see if there's any additional indicators of compromise like uh, URLs, host names, or other IOCs, either in the source code of the page or in the message itself. Um, if we get URLs, We'll try and determine first, are they listed in the Alexa top 500? Um, because we don't want to block a page that's in heavy use. Um, most of the time, that's not the case anymore. I mean, it's pretty safe to say that the fake phishing pages or malicious URLs are typically either compromised um, uh, pages off of another company's website. They're, they're hosted on a third party provider. Um, they're usually not, you know, one of the main websites that people go to on the internet. And then we'll, we have instructions internally to block the implicated domains at the firewall level. Um, we can submit the email addresses um, for blocking as well as takedown on a number of different services. But we'll, we'll continue to flip between the tools and the remediation steps as we get additional information, as we, we dig up more um, information on the attacker in particular. Um, Mike has been working on trying to automate some of these things like we'll we'll depending on the the source of the email address like it'll either be a gmail address or a throwaway email address somewhere we'll have to figure out where the the takedown request is for that email provider and have to manually fill out a web form um, mike's working on some um, python beautiful soup code to automatically submit the email addresses for takedown so we don't have to manually enter that information and basically give us ways to increase the tempo of our response. Yeah, that that's that's exactly right. And it's really, I mean, that when when it is one of these these uh, gift card scams or these phishing attacks that aren't coming from some known bad domain, but just a throwaway account. Really, our only recourse is to submit a takedown request because we just the the O three sixty five team just doesn't have the bandwidth to put these extensive block manage these extensive block lists and it just and they they're usually ephemeral accounts so blocking them permanently just starts to create these giant lists of email addresses that become unwieldy and and uh so we we've really found that a good strategy is just to issue the takedown request and we feel like in most cases gmail most of them are pretty good about it the problem is everybody has a different methodology for submitting those requests. Mm -hmm. So we have on our, you know, part of our documentation is just a reference page for how each of these big domains, as we see them, figure out how you go in, how you do the request and then document that. In some cases, it's sending an email. In some cases, it's a form submit that you have to find, things like that. So that's that's really been our, our main response for these ones that have just created these ephemeral throwaway accounts. Right. Oh, there we go. So, um, so along with um, you know the the work that we do, one of the things as just you know that we thought that we really found value in in terms of managing phishing in a decentralized environment was uh, making sure that the workflow for fishes sort of made logical sense, right? So. We spent a lot of time working with um, LSPs and working internally to develop, uh, you know, what we could just look at and say, you know, does, does this make sense? So we have, you know, as email, uh, as a fish comes into our intake, you know, user submits something that they've received as a fish, you know, we do certain number of 
uh, a certain number of checks, right? If they send it to the security email, you know, we have to know, uh, we have to look at the email because we don't know necessarily that it is just a phishing email. If we if they send it, we developed a, a phishing specific email address, simply phishing at isc.upend.edu. If you send it to that email address, you get an, the end user gets an auto response, letting them know that we've seen it and we're going to continue to work on it. And that if they haven't submitted credentials and they're just reporting it, that to let them know that, you know, we are working on it and we will take steps to do the remediation. And if uh, and also lets them know if they have submitted any sort of credential and they are they are suspicious of that credential to immediately contact their LSP. Right. And so. The idea with this workflow diagram, and not to get too into the weed, you know, into the weeds of everything that happens here, but it's basically we developed a system internally that says when email comes into our system, you know, make quick determinations about the threat that it's involved, and then as quickly as we can get that alert or detection or or report out to the local service provider to you know, look around in their environment, see if other people have submitted some things to their ticket systems, you know, really go as quickly as they can get it out to the end user to do remediation. However, if an LSP thinks that there's something more nefarious at foot or thinks that might be a widespread problem and they need to back channel a response back to us, we want to make sure that those responses get back to us in a way that we know that this is a second tier incident uh, or this is, a, you know, this is this is raised up in its in its severity. So. Um, this diagram just sort of outlines our best effort to make sure that um, we're getting the first the first pass things out to end users, and we're also um, working with the LSPs to get things that they need to send back in for further analysis. So if we fast forward to um, the present or the recent past, um, uh, in 2018, um, ISC and the Office of Information Security made a request for additional resources from the executive vice provost to improve email security. Uh, we had been tracking metrics around threats. You know, we've we've been looking at uh, incidences that had raised you know, bells and whistles for us because of the risk that they posed to the university, the risk they posed to the staff, you know, the reputation. And it was clear that email security was a big problem. And the fact and the decentralization and uh, just the the uptick in scams that we saw, the, we had a couple years of really pretty heavy uh, tax time scams. You know, they, they were becoming targeted and we knew that we just needed a better... Um, email system and 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 really the driver for the better system was centralizing email for security reasons so we got to work uh the goals were to centralize email come up with a common uh scan and uh filtering for phishing and malware using you know one of the best of breed products that's available um uh, you know on the market the goal had to include centralized logging and monitoring and alerting on uh, security issues that we saw. One of the asks of OIS was that the email security uh, improvement of involve allowing us to rewrite URLs to protect end users from malicious links. Um, and then also uh, money be put aside to dedicate to investigate and respond to email abuses that evaded our automation and, and our current technical controls. And, you know, anybody who handles phishing messages or has a system in place to alert on things that that the system believes are phishing knows that there are a lot of things that evade technical controls and there are also a lot of false positives. And, uh, you know, we really needed hands on and eyes on uh, glass to make those determinations. So, you know, it was it was uh, it was ex it was accepted pretty easily i mean like people were had uh, by 2018 you know people understand that email is a commodity it directors understand email is just a commodity they weren't they were becoming less and less interested in having their own slick solution or their own open source solution or whatever motivated them so even though some schools you know wanted some stipulations and assurances uh and were a little bit luck, uh, reluctant to give up control many understood that centralization just had so many benefits that uh that we had um, 
you know, that it was, it was worth giving it a shot and continue the discussion. The URL defense, at least here, was the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome. Uh, IT directors were very worried about the blowback from uh, faculty uh, on, you know, their email privacy and URL defense. And we really had to, uh, you know, make the case that the the blocking and tackling that's done for these URL, this URL blocking is, is very programmatic. You know, we're not making, we're not quote unquote, looking at your email. You know, we're, we're going through with, with broad strokes and doing programmatic things to emails to find and alert on suspicious activity. So we, we built some consensus and we got the, the, um, the sort of slowly got the ball rolling on the, on an email security project, bringing, uh, you know, all these desperate email systems together. And then, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, smack in the middle of this project, uh, we had a Pen 0365 email account compromise that uh, of a of a uh, a very important person at one of the schools and centers here. Um, he was compromised compromised by a phishing email. You know, he uh, this person did a lot of traveling and had a, a number of administrative assistants. So there was multiple people checking the email at multiple hours and multiple time zones. And that really made him, uh, this person, you know, uh, susceptible to a phishing attack because all those little bells and whistles that go off, why did I get this email in the middle of the night? You know, why did it come from this strange address? You know, somebody who has email forwarded them from their own trusted sources, you know, who may, who may send it to, to, the the vip you know the admin assistant sends it to the vip and then there's a certain level of trust that's assumed so then they click on the email even though the original email was bad um uh the account was uh they, they really they had persi the attackers in this case had persistence on the SC account the account was used to send email addresses with a different return address out to the victim's contact list they they used uh, uh, this lookalike account to send out wiring instructions for alumni donor contributions, and um, according to people on the uh, that we worked with during this incident, uh, you know, uh, they said, how, to, how, "How did they put it? Uh, lay people would recognize names on the donor list. You know, it wasn't it was a scary, elaborate donor list, and you know, I say no more, right? But that really." So, and the other thing was, you know, not, not for nothing. I mean, that was this, probably the scariest part, but again, the attacker had really established persistence on this account. They were deleting old emails. They were changing email rules. They were changing forwarding rules. They were, you know, really cleaning up after themselves. And it really put the fear of uh, compromise in a lot of IT directors. And it, again, it, it couldn't have come, um, at a better time uh, because we were really trying to build consensus for the email security project. Right. Uh, so I'll turn that over to, I'll turn that over to Bob to sort of pull that back up for a minute. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, reiterate that it caused a lot of the administrators and the IT directors to get religion on email security and sort of fast track some of the things we were proposing. Um, so the lesson learned is never waste a good incident. Um, image here is the Montparnasse derailment. That's a very famous picture that's been going around the internet. Um, this particular accident brought a lot of attention to upgrading the air brakes on steam locomotives and make them more reliable so accidents like this couldn't happen. Um, and a lot of times this comes, you know, after the fact, unfortunately. So we sort of dodged a bullet in this past incident in that the university didn't lose money. We didn't lose reputational access to um, the people that are donating money to the university. So it, it really ended up being the best possible scenario. Um, but sometimes it takes an incident to make users realize that the controls are important. And it really did give us the political capital to push um, things like URL defense. Um, we have, can you, uh, Bob, do you mind backing up just a slide? Not at all. Just one more, one more up. One more back? Sure. Yeah. Oh no, one more back. Sorry, the email security project. So just to so just yeah. to talk a little bit about this, because I sort of I sort of skipped over this. So so the email security project, not to belabor this too much, there was a couple of things that happened. One of the things was 
we created a custom pen email routing service uh, run by ISC. And this allowed, the, it gave the schools and centers the flexibility to continue to make those determinations around where mail goes at the end of the day. So they could still, mail could come through our central um, routing service and based on LDAP records, uh, still get to the destination it wanted to. So people could still get to, uh, mail could still go, you know, if they wanted students email to go to Gmail and they wanted their uh, the faculty and staff to go to a 365, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, updating this LDAP record and then schools and centers could continue to use their workflows and the processes that they had already had in place and just tie them into the pen email routing service. And the other thing is we landed on Proofpoint for a common solution to uh, sit in front of this email routing service um, and in front of our email administrator might might yell at me if I get this wrong, is sit in back of or in front of, but sit in in line with um, the uh, with the pen email routing system. And Proofpoint does our malware, checks our phishing, you know, account uh, account compromise, and um, and we really uh, and then and then finally um, uh, URL defense. So we could go back down to that one. Sure. So the um, so now, so now, you know, thinking back on the main system, we have all the logs going into Splunk now, the email logs going into Splunk, it gives us really great visibility for things coming in. And then we also have URL defense. And uh, URL defense was, like I said, a, a little tougher sell. Uh, IT directors worry about privacy implications of having, um, you know, someone in your email, someone in your email rewriting links you know, we really tried to uh, uh, assuage those fears by, you know, really saying, hey, this is this is programmatic stuff. You know, this is happening in a, in a very programmatic way. Uh, you know, we're, we're blocking, you know, what we know to be bad links. We had we made sure that we had a, um, a, uh, uh, a clear workflow for submitting false positives to the IT group. You know, in, in the decentralized environment, there's always discussions when you bring these central things together around who's going to do all the things now that they're central. And so we worked with the O365 team to determine, you know, the O365 or the, the email team in ISC runs the proof point service for the most part in terms of administration. And we really worked a lot with them to draw clear lines of distinction around whose responsibility is what. So taking in false positives, doing those, those sorts of checks, handling a lot of the support for those falls in OIS large scale configurations of the systems, you know, making big changes to the system falls on the, the, we call them the O365 team, but they're really more of the, you know, the mail, the central mail team for ISC that, that also runs O365. Um, if you're not familiar with URL defense, oh, so the other thing was, of course, and we don't, I don't put it in the slide here, but, or no, we do mention, we do mention, I'm sorry, was the COVID factor. So, mm -hmm. so we'll get to that in a minute. So what happens is, um, as email passes through the system, anything that's identified as a link, if it has HTTP, uh, colon slash slash, if it has www, um, uh, will, what will happen is the proof point system will rewrite that email with a unique link. And that link directs uh, the user first to the URL defense service. That is a, uh, it's, it's analysis in a, in a sandbox. And then as long as that information isn't met to, you know, you know isn't, as long as the email isn't to be discovered to be malicious, then it, it sent or the website discovered to be malicious, it sends you right on to your uh, final uh, destination almost seamlessly. You know, I, users very we have we we don't have many blocks, and and uh, my personal experience, and I know you know um, anecdotally the the redirect is very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that uh, helped push this project forward and helped give us the, uh, the um, you know, the support we needed to get URL defense instantiated was the COVID effect. Uh, we had, we relied heavily on a, a service we called SafeDNS, which did the same sort of blocking, but it was managed by OIS. And, you know, we would add names to the SafeDNS block list. And then anybody using DNS on campus, the DNS servers on campus, would be beholden to the blocks that we had set in place. 
And we also did the same thing with our Palo Alto firewalls. We put URL filtering rules in place and we managed them as people submitted them as, and as we discovered threats. When no one came to campus for a year, the, that population sort of changed drastically. And as we scrambled to roll out VPNs and do all these other things, uh, the push for URL defense was obvious for, for, from a security standpoint because it was our best way to get out in front of people clicking mm -hmm. on malicious links. Um, we found this to be um, a highly available service. And uh, it, yeah, they have multiple redirectors across multiple domains. And, um, you know, we, you know, knock on wood, we have not had um, downtime with the service, you know, as of yet. Yeah, as contentious as this potentially was, a lot of the um, communications directors were worried about their marketing emails um, not going through. Um, Mike was involved in a large project to try and understand the impact and get communication out and involve multiple organizations. But at the end of the day, we turned it on and there were zero support calls. So that was a huge success. Yeah, and and just in this case, we talked the 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 project team that that worked with everyone to get the to roll out URL defense and get the word out to people. The whole time, it sort of felt like we were confident this was going to be successful, and you know, but we we knew we were we were steadfast in our resolve that we still had to make sure that the communication plan w was made sense and went out to people multiple multiple times. You know, because the last thing we wanted to do was face a situation where people were confused, they didn't understand what was going on, and you know, leadership at the university said roll back the service because if you roll if you if you turn it on and then turn it off the the likelihood that you're going to turn it on again is like you're 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 pushing that rock right back up the hill. Right. And we really so we really concentrated on working with client care and higher IT. That's our that's our central IT units and uh, schools and centers and IT leadership to make sure that they everyone was on board with what was happening and when it was happening and and what the impact was going to be. And the success of all that was and you know the, the success of all that work was for us that on day one we got zero support calls. You know, we reached back in, we woke up early, everybody regrouped and we checked after, you know, midday or whatever after we turned the service on, we checked again later that day and and later that week and at the end of the week and client care and higher IT reported no issues, right? And I think we've had a couple questions about it and it's been turned on now for probably four months, five months. And we've had a couple a couple questions about it come through, but but very few. So we've really considered that a pretty big success and a, and a and a pretty big value add to the email service. Absolutely. So this one improving, improving also, visibility. Yeah. So all right. So and I see we're coming up on three minutes. So we're we're talking a lot here. I want to make sure we get to questions. Um, so I'll, I'll breathe through this. So the main story is, you know, we now have the proof point tap dashboard. Uh, in the meantime, we also uh, brought in CrowdStrike uh, for endpoint detection and response. And we began to lean heavily on the cloud app security data available through the O365 dashboard. Mm -hmm. And all of these three things have increased our visibility tenfold, right? We just, we have all this insight into users activity and what that means for us is a lot of manual work right now. I mean, that's the stage we're in. We have this developed uh, operating procedure for handling incidents and doing incident response. And now we have all this new data to correlate, new IP address information, new indicators to compromise. Uh, Cloud App Security gives us, you know, lots of IOCs, IP address IOCs. Um, Proofpoint Tap Dashboard gives us uh, URL uh, URL defense um insights you know url defense alerts that give us indicators to compromise you know we have even more of a mechanism now every day we have opportunity to to take some time um when you're whoever's on the rotation for processing tickets and look through these uh url defense alerts and really the work right now has been using the same strategies that we've used all along in, in terms of incident response and invoking the pickerel process and, and and also just doing investigations and using the tools we have splunk and these other things to make correlation around high value fishes because with all this new visibility and all these new alerts and all these new you know panes of glass that we can look at comes tons of false positives and tons of, you know, just tons and tons of information that we really 
now have to go to work correlating and coming up with high confidence alerts that we can then automate and get directly to the LSPs as quickly as possible. Right. Um, so while all that was really, I mean, that really the, the centralization and proof point and these new intakes and new data sources for incident response are really the story here. Um, a couple other things that we, as we were going through these, we definitely wanted to make sure we mentioned were um, one important thing in a decentralized place is having, building good relationships with local service providers and with the people on the operation side of the email system you're running. And if you have a person that is dedicated to security and is willing to work with you and is excited about finding these bad things and telling you about them and, and engaging in that part of the work and not just the operation of running the email system, you will be, uh, you'll be well off, you know, you'll be, you'll be in a very good situation when you build good relationships with the apps teams. The other thing is, um, while all this was going on, there were separate efforts to It's like Mike might have frozen there. Um, we were in, rolling out um, two factor for O365 at the same time all these other changes. So there's lots lots of things in flight at the moment. Um, and implementing two-factor for our central credentials really eliminated our central credential compromises. So that um, really proved to administration we should be rolling this out for email because that's where attackers were targeting. Um, in addition, we're looking at installing a fish button as a plugin for centrally managed Outlook instances so they can just click a button and report the fish right then and there. And we also um, offer a self-phishing service through our office, um, through our uh, director of training and awareness, uh, William Yunus. Um, she works with the schools and centers if they want to um, fish their users for a training exercise. Um, I'm going to go through these a couple of these relatively quickly to make sure we've got time for questions. Like I said, it's offered through OIS. It's another proof point product. It's formerly Wombat. Um, we collaborate with the customers. It's not something that's forced on them. We develop custom phishing messages and allow a teachable moment page. And there's some reporting at the end of the campaign. Um, oh, also, we, we send the sample message and campaign dates ahead of time so that when we start getting reports from end users, we know that it's part of the phishing campaign and not something that's malicious. Um, the reporting, um, I think, is still in development at the moment. It sort of gives an idea of how many people opened the email, clicked on it, um, and use that to feedback to the organization to tell where they should probably be targeting their work um, for additional training opportunities. And like I said, this is still a work in progress. So we're still iterating through a lot of these things. Um, so where we are with the current state. Hey, Mike, I'm back. Great. My computer literally just turned off in the middle of that. I mean, I, that couldn't have been more, I heard the fan going. So I, okay. I, 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 sorry, go ahead, Bob. No, this is this is you. Uh, so the current currently where we are, um, we're developing a standard operating procedure um, uh, for for phishing in particular. We've got lots of visibility, but not a lot of repeatable process at the present. And so we're trying to get that. So if we have a new person come on board, we can hand them a document and say this is how we deal with phishing at the university. But we're not quite there yet. Um, the gift card scam. I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with this. It's it's still an issue. It's a hands-on investigation and it may not be limited to email. We're still, we're getting people um, that are being redirected to personal email accounts, we're redirected to text messaging. So it's out of band or out of our visibility. Um, and we're still dealing with highly targeted faculty impersonation, including lookalike email addresses that pop up. Um, so that's, that's still where we currently are. Um, we, did you, we have a, we have a, um, a note in the chat, uh, do we have a policy for repeat fish clickers? No, I mean, I think it depends on the school and center. Again, it's highly decentralized, so it's up to them to sort of determine what they're doing. But I believe they're going through additional training. If they've gone through a self fishing exercise, depending on the organization, like if they deal with financial data, they probably are, have more stringent requirements about what the training is than the folks that are just um, teaching um, history to the students, for instance. Um, so it, it completely varies, but there's no central university mandate saying if you click on a fish multiple times, you're going to be you know, brought in front of the HR, for instance. 
a good question. Mike, we're getting some feedback from your mic. Maybe mute anything else that's going on in the background. Um, so Sorry about that. My, lap, my Mac died, and I'm using a, a Linux laptop that's sort of a potato, so I apologize. So, Mike, I'll, I'll take over from here just to reduce the amount of noise going forward. Um, so, in the future, um, we have a couple of initiatives that we're looking at that are pretty complex and trying to get those up and running using sender policy framework and domain keys identified mail in order to reduce the number of false messages or spoofed messages that are coming in. But that's not an easy lift, and that's something that Mike is working heavily on with the, with the email team um, to try and plan that out for future. Um, and then with Proofpoint in general, we're looking at automating alerts to schools and centers, um, improving the threat hunting and developing metrics. Um, it's still a product that us in the team are getting used to and, and moving forward. Um, I would say that we're a three-person operation center, and there's a lot of different tools that we have in our stable at the moment. Um, so getting to be experts in all of them is, is, takes a lot of training and awareness and practice. And so we're, we're, I can say we're getting there, but that's, that's currently where we currently are. Um, so overall, the takeaways, uh, we, we have processes for handling phishing developed in the past that we still got in place. Um, re increasing our visibility with the different products that we've got have really reduced our response times in, from days to hours to minutes in some cases. Um, but you know, we still have to use multiple intelligence sources to correlate um, the information together to sort of reduce that signal to noise ratio to let us know that we're dealing with something you know, legit instead of something that may not require attention. Um, but in the end, real world impacts, financial impacts, loss of service to physical like elevators, for instance, are the greatest driver for change. Um, and like I said earlier, you never wanna waste a good incident. Um, Generally speaking, the appetite for security is only getting greater while our staffing levels really aren't keeping pace. I mean, we're a three person shop with a director and a couple of ops people. Um, automation is really the only way we're gonna be able to be the force multiplier to keep, up, to keep us responding as quickly as we can, to keep the high level of service, um, but not necessarily have to bring on additional staff. So with that, I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Bob and Mike. We do have some questions in the Q&A section. Uh, this one here comes from Tad. Uh, how do you handle impersonation attacks? Um, if it's using university um, logos or pretending to be the university, the Office of the Secretary will work with um, the hosting providers or our Office of General Counsel to send takedown requests. Um, but it, it, again, it sort of all depends. We don't have a one size fits all solution. The second question here is, do you, uh, do you have not, wait, rewrite URLs such as internal EDU domain, Zoom links. Uh, so do you have a policy to not re rewrite URLs? No, so if anything is coming through our central email system, it's going to be rewritten if it contains a URL. I mean, that's just the way that it, it functions. Another question here from Alexander is, do you- hey, I just like, I know, I'm, I know I'm loud, but we, we actually don't rewrite upen.edu URLs. Oh, and, thanks for that. And there's a lot of them out there, and, and we know that that's sort of a problem. Um, but that's just, that's the configuration of Proofpoint right now, and, and we're just, it's a known, just a known current state. Thanks, Mike. Another question here from Alexander is, uh, do you also delegate some of the security down to individual departments? How do you balance your responsibilities as a CISO versus their responsibilities as system owners? Great question. Um, so the larger schools and centers have dedicated security shops or security personnel that handle operational security within their organizations. Um, we're available for consultations or incident response. So the university policy says, for incident response, it's our responsibility to sort of direct those things. But we have what's um, what's known as a security liaison for each of the schools and centers, at least somebody identified to be the point of contact, be it a security person or not, that we can work with in the case of an incident or in the case of announcements for um, critical vulnerabilities that need to be patched immediately. Um, so we have that sort of level of organization. 
I hope that answers the question for you. Well, I think that brings us to time. Thank you, Bob and Mike, for your incredible presentation. Uh, for the rest of us, um, we will be taking a 10-minute break and returning uh, with uh, more sessions at 12 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everybody.